very nice to see so many faces here. Um, I, um, hoping that this is the end of the gray, rainy weather for me to have. I hear that we're supposed to be getting some sunny weather. Um, but uh, then maybe not so many of you will be here next week. So it's a mixed blessing. I'd like to start off today um, with this quote from Robert Goldwater, uh, who wrote a now classic book called Primitivism in Modern Art way back in 1938, one of the first in English on this topic. Uh, and it's perhaps surprising to some of you to read the words uh, of this American art historian, uh, who noted that by 1885, quite some time ago, all of the different styles of primitive art were known in the West. And that after that, it was only a matter of more examples of the same thing being discovered. So implicit in this statement is the fact that by 1885, much of the rest of the world had been, quote unquote, discovered by Europeans, and in many cases, colonized by them. Germany, as we know, came late to this game of grabbing up colonies around the world. So for example, Germany had only just annexed its portion of New Guinea uh, in 1884. However, during the 19th century, much of Africa, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific were divided among the European states so that by World War I, European empires extended all across the globe. With colonization, of course, came missionaries, traders, government administrators, scientists, anthropologists, all of who encountered non-Western objects, and to varying degrees, and for various reasons, eventually all of them collected them. So in contrast to last week, when I focused on the indigenous meaning of non-Western objects, today my focus is on the impetus for the West's collection of those objects and their taxonomic transformations, this time from artificial curiosities, those man-made objects, to objects that were then called ethnographica, the same objects, valued and collected for the scientific role that they could play in the demonstration of newly developing scientific theories about diversity, race, social evolution, the most intense period of the West's collecting of non-Western artifacts coincided with the heyday of colonialism. Thus, although it may be true, as Goldwater claimed, that all of the styles of non-Western art were known by 1885, though there may be some of you, art historians, anthropologists, who would contest this statement, I'm interested in the implications of the second part of this statement the more examples of the same thing. Who wanted these examples? And for what purpose? Were missionaries interested in them for the same reasons as ethnographers or government administrators? What types of relationships are hidden within concepts such as pagan idol idols, firewood even, as they were sometimes called, and ethnographica? What types of changing political as well as epistemological agendas are embedded in the changing terminologies of artificial curiosities when they're transformed into ethnographic artifacts? It is this colonial chronotope of collecting, roughly the period from the middle of the 19th century to World War I, that I'll be examining today. Once again, I'm going to focus my comments and examples primarily on Oceania, uh, but the same catalysts and actors could also be found in Africa, South America, and Asia. Certainly, Westerners were collecting non-Western artifacts long before this period, as objects in museums from James Cook's voyages, and even earlier, such works such as um, Christian Feast has mentioned about American Indian artifacts in European museums clearly demonstrate. 
<clears throat> However, following anthropologist Nicholas Thomas's characterization of the collection of non-Western artifacts as a dominant characteristic of the culture of colonialism, I want to discuss why this activity played such an important role in the process of European colonization. It was a two-way process that created long-distance relationships between individuals in the colonies and in the metropole, as well as intense, sometimes intimate, other times antagonistic, relationships between Westerners and indigenous people in the colonies. As is well known, this period gave rise to museums of natural history and the newly established science of ethnology. Non-Western artifacts became, in the words of Johannes Fabian, paying homage to Levi Strauss, good to think, good to label, good to classify, judge, attribute to, serve as evidence, in short, to carry out all those operations by virtue of which information becomes knowledge. But they also became, as Paul Van der Kriek reminds us in uh, his study of collecting, and here he's quoting Baudrillard, they also uh, had a uh, mental dimension to them over which one holds sway a thing whose meaning is governed by myself or oneself alone. It's all my own, the object of my passion. And here he again, as I said, is quoting Baudrillard on another dimension of the practice of collecting. But prior to the establishment of museums and their collections based on principles of classification, during the late Renaissance, there ex existed another type of collection that was based more on this disorderly passion for curiosities. So, <clears throat> uh, and an encyclopedic appetite for the marvelous or the strange. And again, I'm sure this is familiar to many of you the idea or the objects called Kunst or Wunderkammers in German, cabinets of curiosity in English. And here we have an example of one in color, and here is the original engraving of this cabinet that belonged to the Danish collector Ole Wurm uh, from his Museum Warnianum. This was in 1655. There are several characteristics here of uh, the genre of cabinet of curiosities. The style of display of the items, things hanging from the ceiling, there were natural curiosities, skeletons of unusual animals, fish and birds, and we see a classic item in this genre, a crocodile, as well as um, an Indian, um, an Inuit, uh, Kayak, sorry. So uh, I'm going to list some of the various objects that were found in cabinets of curiosities belonging to an Englishman named Cope. This was 100 years later from uh, this cabinet uh, in 1755. It included, quote, flies of a kind that glow at night in Virginia instead of lights, since there is often no day there for over a month. A number of crowns made of claws, a Madonna made of Indian feathers, an Indian charm made of monkey teeth, a mirror which both reflects and multiplies objects, a sea halicon's nest, a sea mouse, reed pipes like those played by Pan, and a long, narrow Indian canoe that in this one it had oars and sliding planks, but was also hanging from the ceiling. The author of this list, one Thomas Plotner, visiting Cope from Basel, called these objects strange things. Displayed in a random manner, 
the only distinction concerning objects, the collectors of such cabinets of curiosities, or strange things, made in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries was between things that were considered naturalia, such as shells, minerals, birds, and animals found in the natural world, and things that were artificiali, bows and arrows, baskets, canoes, and snowshoes, things that were man-made. I want to show you just a couple of other examples of this genre, and I'm going to go back to this uh, picture uh, that I showed at the beginning, which is actually a photograph of the reproduction that I showed you. And it's located in my hometown of Los Angeles. So if any of you come to LA, be sure to go to the Museum of Jurassic Technology, which itself is both a museum and a parody of a museum where they've recreated this original cabinet of curiosities. So here, just to give you a sense that there was indeed a genre to these uh, cabinets, um, we see another uh, that was found in Italy, as well as another Italian one. And in this one, I'd like you to note again the crocodile in the ceiling. So the individuals who created these collections tended to be both very wealthy individuals and learned. Very frequently, they worked as apothecaries, and their collections grew out of their interest in plants and minerals for their medicinal purposes. As Steve Mullaney, that's a scholar who's written about the late Renaissance, points out, collectors valued things that were naturalia more highly than things that were artificiali. For example, many of the artificial things that we would label ethnographic artifacts, things that later ended up in the uh, British Museum, for example, once they got there to that museum, were sort of relegated to the um, rags and bones corner of the museum. It was only later that uh, scientists, particularly anthropologists, rediscovered what was there and identified these objects as being of significant value. Although these Kunst and Ver uh, Wunderkammers uh, are often considered to be the precursors of today's museum, contrary to common thought, Mullaney argues that their relationship to later museum collections is a discontinuous one, one even when the objects displayed were themselves preserved and carried over, as in the case of Dresden and the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford. Instead, he suggests that the museum as an institution rises from the ruins of these collections. He suggests they're like country houses built from the dismantled stonework of dissolved monasteries. It organizes the wonder Wunderkammer by breaking it down, that's to say by analyzing it, regrouping the randomness and the strange into recognizable categories that are systematic discreet and exemplary. The museum, as an institution, represents an order and a categorical will to knowledge whose absence or suspension is precisely what is on display in a room such as Coates or Burns. One type of naturalia that I want to point out that um, I showed you earlier, the crocodile, um, is the stuffed body of a crocodile, often seen suspended, as I showed you. Just like the yacht mole we talked about last week, but seemingly for opposite reasons, 17th and 18th century Europeans were captivated by this strange animal that lived in the water, but could also survive on ground. While the yacht mole saw the crocodile as their totemic ancestor and the source of humans in their environment, Europeans were astonished by such a large and dangerous creature that they had never seen before. They even wondered whether God had actually created it. For both Yatmol and Europeans, however, 
Crocodiles were associated with important ontological and religious questions. And similarly, Europeans too represented the form of the crocodile in their art. So what we see here is a silver gilt crocodile. German, made sometime between 1575 and 1600 as a sand container. And here is another representation. Anyone recognize that one? See a couple of smiles. You can just go down to, um, it's, it's uh, not at the Alta, I took this picture here in Frankfurt. It's the Hausmann um, uh, fountain that's close to where the Euro, where the Euro is, by the new uh, opera house. So there's some crocodiles there. Uh, Never seen before. <laughs> Furnishing. Although cabinets of curiosities may be discontinuous in terms of the development of later scientific practices of categorization, they do represent continuity in terms of the Western social practice of collection and display. We see an example here, which again, many of you may recognize since it's German. Um, an example of the social and political dimension of collecting in a gift of amber. This cabinet was made entirely out of amber from the uh, area, uh, area that was ruled over by the King of Prussia. He gave this to the Prince of Saxony. Not only was the cabinet itself a thing of wonder, but other wonders and strange things could be kept inside of it for display. Not only were strange objects being brought back to Europe from other parts of the world, but people were too. As the example of an Eskimo couple that the English explorer Martin Frobisher brought with him to London from Canada in 1577. They survived there for a year, uh, going out in their kayak, the man fishing on the Thames, or duck hunting, I think he was actually doing. And, as Mulaney points out, about strange people and things, difference draws us to it. It promises pleasure, and it serves as an invitation to first-hand experience, otherwise known as colonization. However, only a few of the owners of Wunderkammers actually traveled to, the dis to distant places themselves. They purchased items for their collection from people who had. As Europeans embarked more frequent, on more frequent voyages of discovery and commerce, especially during the 18th and the early part of the 19th century, sailors, officers, military men, and whalers brought back curios from their travels that they sold to interested collectors. Objects from the culture areas of Polynesia, Micronesia, and Melanesia were some of the earliest examples of non-Western art to be brought to Europe. Followed not too long after following, not too long after objects from the New World, objects from Africa came somewhat later. So, one of the best-known sources of artificial curiosities to circulate in Europe in the 17th century were items from the three voyages that Captain Cook made between 1767 and 1779. Uh, I feel a little hesitant to be talking about this when we have a scholar who has written so much on these collections, uh, Professor Brigitte hauser Schablin, but I'm going to plunge ahead and talk a little bit about uh, these items and what happened to them. As George Forster, one of the naturalists that accompanied Cook on his second voyage, wrote, we were entertained with various new and striking objects. So here we see uh, Cook, uh, and here we have um, a painting that was done by an artist on board his voyage uh, to Tahiti. This is uh, Mankavi Harbor on the island of Tahiti. So we see the two ships, Cook's and his companion, where they landed. And Cook was fascinated by the outrigger canoes built by the Tahitian and other Pacific Islanders that you see in this painting. Um, while he was there, 
He collected things like mourning attire worn by Tahitians during mortuary ritual. That's what you see here on the left. And on the right, a Tahitian feather breast ornament worn by royalty. Though I didn't take these pictures, I could have. I just saw them up in Göttingen uh, in the uh, Institute of Ethnology's uh, museum there. It was uh, like a, a pilgrimage for me to go see these objects that I'd read so much about. Um, and here I have the quote from Forster that I mentioned. Um, and an important part of uh, these three voyages and other voyages of discovery was um, the representation of these objects. So there were artists on board who were beginning uh, to document uh, all of the various objects um, that they found of interest. Uh, here you have things from a variety of places in the Pacific. Uh, and what I found interesting here is um, this is um, a catalog, and it's called, as I hope you can read, a catalog of curiosities. Uh, and these uh, went first um, to Oxford, and then they were distributed. It's an interesting story about how some of these ended up in Göttingen. Um, here is another uh, painting that was done representing some of the activities of exchange of items that were going on on these voyages. So here you see some uh, Australian Aborigines approaching uh, Cook's men with objects in their uh, hands. And I'm going to quote a little bit um, from Cook about this uh, type of exchange. Cook was sometimes dismayed that it was easier for him and his crew to get curios than the fresh food that they desperately needed. As he wrote in his journal in 1774, all the others came empty in respect to refreshments, but brought with them some arms such as clubs, darts, etc., which they exchanged away. Indeed, these things generally found the best market with us, such as the prevailing passion for curiosity or for what appeared new. So everyone from Cook on down to the most um, uh, common sailor were involved in the exchange um, of Western goods for um, uh, the uh, objects that the islanders were bringing them. Cook goes on to say that, as I've had occasion to make this remark more than once before, the reader will think the ship must be full of such articles by this time. He will be mistaken, for nothing is more common than to give away what has been collected at one island for anything new at another. Even if it is less curious, this together with what is destroyed on board if the owners are tired with looking at them, prevents any considerable increase. There are several things about this passage that are interesting, aside from the fact that Cook was obviously consciously addressing a readership that he had in mind, a you and me of the time. Uh, one is that based on Cook's last comment, it seems surprising that any items made it back to England. Another is that we uh, see how the sailors themselves began to function as conduits for the exchange of objects between islands taking items from uh, far away from where they are originally produced to exchange them for items that were produced other places. So there became a kind of a more rapid circulation and a far distant circulation of objects um, uh, that might have been what might have taken, other, taken place otherwise before uh, Europeans came. Uh, thus facilitating the spread of new ideas, designs, and styles throughout the Pacific region and beyond. Here I have a couple of other slides of objects that they were collecting. Uh, a Marquesan headdress decorated with a pearl shell disc, delicately carved tortoiseshell design attached to the pearl shell disc, and then a top notch of black and white feathers. Uh, I believe this is a Maori um, uh, club uh, weapon, and perhaps the most famous uh, of all of the items uh, in terms of its recent circulation from Göttingen to Hawaii, uh, Australia, and then uh, before returning home to Basel, 
um, was a feather headdress. And this item, I was so surprised to see, it's only about this big. Uh, heretofore, I wondered how in the world has it ever gotten back from the Pacific? Um, since some of these he feather headdresses that I've seen in Hawaii are very, very large. Soon after Western explorers began their voyages of exploration to the New World, Africa, and the Pacific, they brought back more than just artificial curiosities to Europe. They also brought back Pacific Islanders, African villagers, and New World Indians. In the very beginning, these, Indian, these individuals were treated with respect and a certain amount of care was taken to assure that they could return to their places of origin if they indeed survived being taken out of their own environment into the European climate. We know, for example, a fair amount about a Tahitian man named Mai, or Omai. And here we see uh, a painting that was done um, in London of Omai. Here on the left, uh, we've got um, Sir Joseph Banks, sitting down here on the right, and in the middle, Dr. Solander, um, two individuals who had traveled with Cook on his first voyage. Uh, so when Omai arrived in London, uh, he was brought to these two men because they had actually seen his homeland, knew a few words of Tahitian, um, and um, portraits were um, painted of Amai. And I'm just going to show these to you because um, I was struck by uh, how un-Tahitian they look. Um, so he arrived the 14th of July, 1774, and was outfitted with a velvet coat, a silk waistcoat, and satin breeches in order to be presented to King George III. However, the painting of Omai by England's most renowned portrait artist of the time, Sir Joshua Reynolds, depicts him in very non-Tahitian and likewise non-British garb, transforming him into an Orientalist vision of an exotic Arabian prince, complete with a turban. Here's another later image of him that uh, represents him with a slightly more Polynesian face and hair by an artist, um, Italian artist, Bertoluzzi, who was also living in London at the time. These images of Omai remind us of this early period's romanticization of non-Western people as noble savages. Omai did return to Tahiti on Cook's third voyage to the Pacific in July of 1776. Not all non-Westerners who made the trip to Europe were as fortunate, nor did they always come with their own volition. Moreover, a mere 25 years after Cook's first voyage to Tahiti, another less benign and more subversive image of non-Westerners began to supplant the noble savage, that of the ignoble or savage barbarian whose soul needed to be converted to Christianity. But non-Western objects also played a prominent symbolic and material role for the Christian missionaries who followed in Cook's footsteps. So in uh, 1789, the newly established London Missionary Society sent its first contingent of missionaries to the Society Islands, 19 young, unmarried men. At this point in time, the London Missionary Society only sent single men to the South Pacific, fearful that the rigors of the voyage, as well as life in the islands, would be too dangerous and difficult for women. By 1790, only eight of the original 19 missionaries were still in the Pacific. Some of them, as we see in this uh, uh, engraving of a man named George Vasson, had gone native taken a, a, to a Tongan wife and uh, remained living in what were called the Friendly Islands. Uh, the London Missionary Society began to change its rules and regulations. And in this painting, uh, you see, um, that was done um, by Robert Schmirk in 1798, titled The Cessation of Matavai Tahiti, 
to Captain James Wilson of the Duff, um, which was actually supposed to represent the first arrival of the missionaries um, to the You'll see that there are women there. Um, by the time he was painting this image, the London Missionary Society had decided to let the missionaries bring uh, women with them. And uh, uh, this early missionary history was repeated time and time again with increasing frequency during the 19th century. It's a story that we're all quite familiar with, so I'm not going to belabor it. Um, uh, not only did they bring their religion, um, but also their European culture as an aspect of their civilizing mission. And so here we see um, one of the most important ways that missionaries worked at converting local people was to first learn their language and then to learn their traditional religious beliefs in order to find both the commonalities between Christianity and the local religion. Uh, they needed to be able to talk about the realm of the religious. As material objects are initially easier to talk about than abstract ideas, or can serve as a means to talk about immaterial things, uh, such as spirits, souls, the afterlife, um, gods and goddesses, objects associated with indigenous ritual were important to both the local populations as well as to the missionaries as a source then of indigenous knowledge. Thus, the arrival of the missionaries initiated a period characterized by the destruction of many of the indigenous statues and other ritual objects that the missionaries considered uh, to be heathen idols, manifestation of the pagan gods associated with the indigenous religious beliefs. Um, so, um, I'm going to show you a couple of prints here that were published in missionary manuals back in uh, England. I've been showing you in this one a before and after. Um, so here you see at the top a representation of what life was like when the missionaries first arrived in any number of villages in the Pacific and what they had to contend with, you know, the lazy, um, uh, natives who all they did was spend their time dancing and uh, singing, um, who lived, you know, who didn't wear much clothing, any number of things you can see represented in that that are in contrast then with what the missionary said it was their uh, mission to do, to civilize people and to uh, teach them a more orderly um, and profitable way of life. Um, so, we can see uh, that um, these were visual narratives, kind of advertisements or propaganda, uh, we might call them today, uh, whose purpose was to induce people to contribute money to s support the missionaries' work abroad. In 1834, Father Francis Carré, the first Catholic missionary to the Polynesian Islands, of Mangoreva, arrived in the Gambier Archipelago, and he succeeded in converting the local population, um, to, uh, in converting the local chief to uh, Catholicism, which meant uh, that then the rest of the population uh, followed him. Um, and although the achievement meant that the islanders burned their pagan idols, though here is another one of these London Missionary Society engravings that represented the success of the missionaries in getting people to um, destroy uh, their, as they called them, um, idols. Uh, so again, we see that um, the destruction of these objects became a very important symbol of the success of the missionaries. Um, although this achievement meant that the islanders had burned their statues, um, Kare, who I was talking about coming to the Gambier Islands, um, kept what he considered to be the best of the statues from their fate as firewood and sent them as gifts to the Pope in Rome. So now I'm going to talk about kind of transition in the role where missionaries are also collectors as well as destroyers of these objects. Um, 
Of course, they served as evidence of Paré's success in converting people, um, but uh, in a record that we have from Paré, he was so moved by these images, this one and another six of them in total, that he sent to the Pope, um, that we can now see these statues today at the Vatican Ethnological Museum uh, in Italy. Although, don't hurry down to Rome right now to see them because they're actually in San Francisco at the Young Museum where, for the first time, the Vatican Ethnological Museum has sent over a couple of hundred of its objects to be on display at the de Young Museum. Ironically, as this example demonstrates, even Christian disciples of God with very different ideas about what constituted art, as well as religion, were impressed with the workmanship of the Mangarevan carvers and felt that it was important to save examples of it, far away, of course, from uh, the people who had made them, where the statues might still evoke the wrong-mindedness uh, of their ideas about what they represented. Um, not only were the statues the missionaries had the islanders destroyed considered to be pagan idols, most of them were thought, with the exception of these Mongolian statues, to be crude and ugly having no moral or aesthetic value. Over time, however, missionaries began to send more examples uh, from the Pacific Islands and other cultures um, back to their homelands and back to the Vatican where they could be put on display as examples of the pagan practices of the islanders and proof again of the need for missionary activities. Um, so beginning in the mid-19th century, century Missionary expositions uh, and fairs became increasingly popular events with the general public, and rather than destroy all the objects related to indigenous religious practices, some of them were sent back to Europe. Um, Kare, thus, was not the only missionary to send artifacts back, uh, and here's another object in that. Um, this is the Vatican, as it says, Ethnological Museum. Um, and it's in the process, I think they're also, has anyone been there recently? I think they're um, extending it or uh, renovating part of that museum. But you can see it's quite extensive. Uh, here was another um, item from Tahiti that was sent to the Vatican. The image representing the deity uh, Oro or Oro from Tahiti, uh, reportedly collected by the Reverend George Bennett. And here's another one of the items that um, is on display in um, San Francisco right now. Um, it was not only uh, the um, Pope who was collecting these objects, but uh, the um, Societas Benedictini, SVD, as many of you know, through um, not only its journal Anthropos, was documenting uh, the meaning of many of these objects. Uh, they also have a house Volker and Kulturen here in Germany, where you can see many of the objects that SVD missionaries had collected. Um, in the Jubilee year of um, 1925, desiring to celebrate the hard work of Catholic missionaries all over the world, Pope Pius the um, 11th organized the Universal Missionary Exhibition at the Vatican. And he requested at that time that every Catholic mission station in the world send at least one item to Rome for the exhibition. There were approximately 100,000 items on display there in 1925. Half of them were returned to their countries of origin, and the other half became the core of the collection in that museum that I showed you. The purpose of the museum, according to the Pope, was to demonstrate that, quote, the dawn of faith among the infidel of today, that was 1925, can be compared to the dawn of faith which illuminated pagan Rome. So he was interested in having people understand that the uh, role of Christian missionaries, and specifically Catholic missionaries, 
um, in the uh, colonial world was similar to what had been going on uh, back in the time of Imperial Rome. Uh, the difference, um, let's see, when the museum's collections were rehoused in the modern galleries that I just showed you, the purpose of the museum, this was in 1973 that that new museum uh, was dedicated, the purpose of the museum was said to have changed. Its new objective was, quote, to show that man is by nature religious. The difference in the museum's purpose between 1925 and 1973 is one that I'll return to in a later lecture. Here I wanted to simply comment that Pope Pius XI's intentions to extol the work of Catholic missionaries at what was then the height of European imperialism. Uh, this is what I want to emphasize. Um, uh, was to show the way in which Christianity was uh, not only a spiritual mission, but was also working hand in glove with colonization at that time. Like other colonists, missionaries, whether Catholic or Protestant, often used artifacts as evidence in the metropolitan discussions about race and development. Uh, was here I was going to talk a little bit about another missionary, George Brown, a British missionary who um, also sent objects uh, back to um, uh, England in this case. Um, as Thomas has pointed out, Europeans usually collected ethnographic, um, collected ethnographic objects during the colonial period, not in order to understand what their meaning was to their creators, but rather for what they signified to Westerners about Western cultural superiority. So again, aside from these few exceptions like Carre that I mentioned, um, uh, not all individuals who became involved with the collection of such objects personally or valued or admired them. Uh, in fact, most individuals who are directly in contact with such objects were settlers in uh, the newly established colonies of the Pacific. So unlike the missionaries who actually had a motivation for learning something about what these objects might have meant to people, even if they didn't always agree with the ideas of what these things meant, at least they wanted to know what they meant and were recording information about it. Um, other settlers in the newly established colonies in the Pacific, uh, government officials, shipping and trading company managers, and their wives and family, um, like the missionaries, uh, not only viewed these objects as pagan idols, but even more dismissively referred to them as firewood. Um, I'm gonna, I'll come back to these uh, objects in a minute. I just want to talk about this idea of firewood. Um, this was specifically a term that um, was used uh, by some of the settlers in what became uh, uh, German uh, New Guinea. Um, so we know beginning around uh, this derogatory label condescendingly implied that despite the workmanship involved in their creating, creation. These objects, from the standpoint of the settlers, if not worthless, they were at best worthwhile only for the utilitarian purpose they could serve as fuel and thus to be destroyed. So uh, this derogatory uh, term was just a way of dismissing uh, not only the objects but the people who had made them. The objects then became symbolic of the um, nature of the relationship and the attitude between these two groups of people. However, as we know, beginning around the third quarter of the 19th century, a new type of Western institution, the Ethnographic Museum, uh, developed and it was a catalyst for new forms of collecting. Uh, its most influential examples were in Berlin, as we see here, London, and Paris, uh, where the British Museum acquired what had been known as the Christie Collection, a large collection of archaeological and ethnographic artifacts in 1865. Adolf Bastian, 
founded the Berlin Königliche uh, Museum for Volkerkunde in 1868. And following the success of the Universal Exposition in 1878, the Trocadero Museum was created in Paris, which later became the Musée de l'Homme. Meanwhile, the American Museum of Natural History had been established in New York City. I'm gonna jump over this. Uh, here uh, is the Melanesian Hall in the uh, Ecological Museum in Berlin. Um, I'm gonna try to get to a couple of other. Uh, is here, yeah. um, and um, meanwhile, as I said, the Museum of Natural History being established in New York City in 1869 and opened in 1874. So by the end of the 19th century, there were ethnological museums in most major European cities. So this included Rome, Stockholm, Vienna, Copenhagen, Hamburg, Munich, Leipzig, and Leiden as well as ethnographic museums affiliated with important universities, such as the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, the Cambridge Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology, and the Peabody Museums at Harvard and Yale. So, I've gone on over this list for you to hopefully give you the sense that by the end of the 19th century, uh, if you were to be a cosmopolitan European or American city, you needed to have an ethnological museum. So where were the museums getting all of these objects? Uh, it wasn't just missionaries who were sending these back. Uh, there began to be businesses, traders, who in places like New Guinea, and here you have an advertisement, which you can't see very well, for one of the major uh, New Guinea uh, collectors um, a company, uh, Godfroy, um, who uh, actually collected items and, as many of you know, set up their own museum in Hamburg where uh, they had objects that they would sell to uh, museums. So, what we begin to see is an impetus um, for many of these museums um, was the impact of Darwin's theory of evolution, which had been published in 1859, uh, as well as the desire to document the range of human diversity found in the natural world. But, and this is the important kind of but that I want to add to the scientific uh, dimensions, um, at least as important with such colonialist thinking as that expressed by uh, Dr. P.H. von Siebold, a physician and botanist who spent time in the Dutch East Indies and Japan. In a letter he wrote in 1843, he urged that ethnological museums be established especially in countries that had colonies because he saw them, and here I'm quoting him, as a means of understanding the subject people and of awakening the interest of the public and of merchants in them, all necessary conditions for a lucrative trade. Van Siebold's own, own collection of objects from Japan became the basis for the establishment in Leiden in 1837 of the Royal Japanese Museum, which became the Rijksmuseum for Volkenkunde in 1864. He was a German by birth, uh, and so he was also influential in his home country in the creation of the Munich and Würzburg Ethnological Museums. So again, we see that the establishment of ethnological museums went hand in glove with the expansion of Western imperialism, and that objects with their ability to enchant and to inspire curiosity and the desire, perhaps, to experience exotic places firsthand was deemed important to the colonial project. With the birth of the ethnographic museum, or its equivalent in museums of natural history, or departments of ethnology, um, and associated museums and universities, we see, as I mentioned before, this intense period of activity, um, the amassing of many, some would even say most, of the items that were later to become sought after as, quote unquote, primitive art. However, although some ethnologists did not value ethnographica primarily for their aesthetic qualities, 
but rather for their technological characteristics and what they could tell them about diversity, race, and the history of human development. There were other individual anthropologists, such as Haddon in England and German-born, German-trained anthropologist Franz Boas in the United States, who were intrigued by the aesthetic dimensions of non-Western objects, as seen in Boas's publication, Primitive Art, which he published in 1928. However, in order for the newly established discipline of anthropology to fulfill its desire for ethnographic artifacts, there had to have been in the colonies a pre-existing condition of possibility in this Kantian sense that there's a prior constitution of objects as goods, if not commodities. Commodification, at least some form of it, the anthropologist Fabian has argued, is not so much the result of collecting, rather than its prerequisite. So rather than saying that it was the desire of these museums to have these objects that led to these objects becoming commodities in um, the colonies, uh, there was already a trade in objects that was going on. Um, so I'm going to just, uh, go on to talk some about Frobenius here. In other words, as um, uh, Fabian has shown with the example of Leo Frobenius, known well to many of us here, uh, and his documentation of his travels in Central Africa, by 1904, when Frobenius arrived there with funds from the Hamburg Museum and the directive to, quote, amass as many things as possible for as little money as possible, he found himself a participant in a, quote unquote, roaring trade in curios. And these are terms from one of his competitors in uh, Central Africa, an Englishman named Hilton Simpson. So Fabian suggests that by the early 20th century, non-Western artifacts had become simply a different type of local resource in Africa. One in addition to rubber and oil and minerals, but a resource nonetheless that indigenous peoples living in the far-flung peripheries of the world could provide to the ever-expanding 19th century capitalist metropolitan centers. Moreover, as he goes on to show, collecting was a political activity, one that had by necessity to be backed up by the exercise of some kind of authority, and often by real force, and thus again was quintessentially a colonial endeavor. So I'm going to uh, hurry a bit uh, in addition to Frobenius, and I love this picture of him as the young uh, explorer. We also had an American, uh, A.B. Lewis, who around the same time was off in New Guinea. His collection became the basis of the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago, their Oceania collections. Here you see some of the things that he collected. Uh, as well as an entire Maori um, meeting house. Uh, we had Franz Boas, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, here we see him in one of the objects he collected uh, on the northwest coast, one of the large uh, masks. And he, was wanted, he wanted to show things like the fact that these objects were used in performance. He wanted to also record the um, uh, actual body uh, language, the embodiment uh, of these objects when they were being worn in performance. His collections became the basis of a very um, famous uh, uh, hall at the American Museum of Natural History. And when I worked there, I walked by this statue every day, not statue, this canoe. Uh, it's at the entrance to the, uh, on the side entrance of the museum. Um, and this is the hall uh, that uh, is as he established it. Um, and that um, has, there have been, there's been some new lighting to it. So this is a more recent photograph uh, than when the anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss wrote about 
this hall uh, when he uh, was in New York as in exile from uh, Europe during World War I, and I'll be talking more about what he had to say about this hall. Um, an early, perhaps apocryphal, but formative memory of Frobenius's that he considered constitutive of his passion for travel to Africa and for Africans was his early visits to the Berlin Zoological Garden, where his grandfather was the director. He recounts seeing Africans on display and later wrote that it was, quote, the maternal kindness of an elderly Nubian woman that essentially gave the child the vital content of his calling. So in his memoirs in 1925, he reflects back on this experience. Thus, by the time Frobenius was a child in the 1870s and 80s, the practice of bringing non-Western people to Europe and the United States had become more commonplace than when Omai visited London. And such foreigners had become more spectacle or human uh, specimen rather than honored guests. So the last thing that I want to talk about before I wrap uh, things up for today uh, is this phenomenon that's recently been the subject of uh, an exhibit uh, at the Quai Branly, uh, where they call uh, human zoos. So this is a phenomenon. And once again, there's been a lot of research done about this recently, uh, a phenomenon that lasted from about 1851 to 1931. And so one of the themes that I've uh, hopefully uh, been weaving in and out in my talk today is that it was both objects and people who were being brought from uh, the um, periphery, from the colonies, to uh, the metropole. Uh, and that they were on display oftentimes in world's fairs and uh, universal expositions. Um, so, um, this uh, phenomenon, uh, as a form of urban entertainment, this genre of spectacle, um, and I just mentioned this, that it was recently the focus of an exhibition uh, at the Musée de Quai Branly. Another important exhibitionary genre that combined both non-Western people and the display of indigenous objects, um, so these universal expositions, began in 1851 in London with the Crystal Palace and its great exhibition uh, of the industry of all nations, it was called. It was the first example of what became a prevalent colonial institution of uh, such acts um, of um, bringing uh, individuals from other countries uh, often were part of a kind of midway uh, carnival-like avenue devoted to games and uh, the display of human freaks of nature, bearded ladies, Siamese twins, as well as, in other parts, more scientific and educational pavilions representing individuals' colonies. So the World's Fair, like the Ethnographic Museum, was a genre of colonial visuality whose form, content, and function, and here I'm going to quote uh, a historian of uh, these fairs, Robert Rydell, turns on understanding that international expositions complemented efforts by powerful groups within industrialized and industrializing nations to consolidate their political and economic authority at home, along with their imperial gains overseas. And so, uh, I'm also going to quote um, Shelley Arrington, I forgot to put in the year that she published her book, 1993. Um, Arrington, in her book, The End of Authentic Primitive Art, and other tales of progress, uh, considers these, uh, the World Fair uh, to um, bring together the concepts of the nation state, the extraction from the non-European world of the raw materials that made industrialization possible, and I was adding to that the idea that ethnographic artifacts, ethnographica, could also be seen as one of those resources, and 
the colonization of the people from whose territories the raw materials were extracted. They all came together uh, in a type of event that displayed and glorified them, the World's Fair. But in addition to their political role, the significance of these expositions to the history of primitive art and the Western appreciation of non-Western objects should not be underestimated. For example, looking back on his earlier years of exploration and collecting in Africa, uh, in the 1920s, Leo Fabrinius is looking back then on these trips that he took um, in the early uh, 20th century and uh, looking at the period before, he said, during the period of the 1890s and the early uh, 20th century, Philology and the natural sciences reigned. Culture in general, and especially the culture of a wild continent as Africa, was anything but popular. Today, so he's contrasting the situation in the 1920s, he says today, on the streets, in the salons, in the lecture halls, nothing, it seems, is so much discussed as culture. Today, he goes on, Buddhas, African figurines and oceanic masks are highly valued in intellectual as well as monetary terms. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? We're talking all about uh, the 1920s. My argument here is that both world's fairs and ethnographic museums and the kind of popular entertainment that we saw in such things as Hagenbeck's uh, Sioux Indian event or uh, the wild uh, <laughs> women of the May, the Amazons, uh, or Australian cannibal boomerang uh, exhibitions. All of these were here in Germany, including this one that uh, is from the Frankfurt newspaper um, uh, in 1885, um, brought uh, a group of Australians. Uh, here's a photograph of one of them. Uh, all of these events, uh, both World's Fairs, ethnographic museums, and uh, popular entertainment, so popular as well as high culture, contributed to the change in attitude that Frobenius was mentioning. So to conclude, with the first collecting of foreign objects by Western explorers such as Columbus and Cook, came also the planting of imperial flags. The objects these Westerners brought back were also metaphoric representations of the physical territories and peoples these Western polities were acquiring. If, as scholars of colonialism, such as Anne Stoller have written, and here I'm quoting her, a colony is a tenuous, illegitimate, provisional political formation that only sustains itself by turning people into other social kinds, it's the end of her quote, so uh, I'm suggesting that some of these other social kinds are turning uh, pagans into Christian, villagers into laborers, chiefs into subordinate colonial representations. The colonial forms of display of non-Western objects and people that I've described today were created in part to reinforce these inherently unstable formations. However, non-Western objects are ambiguous and multifaceted forms, and thus their collection and their display at world's fairs and in museums have paradoxical legacies. If, on the one hand, they have sometimes played a role in a colonial agenda, as I've argued today, at the same time, They've expanded our Western understanding and appreciation of human diversity and form, and thus are an integral part of Western modernity and modern art. As we will see next week, it was at the 1889 Colonial Exposition in Paris, the Exposition Universelle, that the artist Paul Gauguin and Vincent van Gogh first saw statues from Africa and Oceania. It should not be surprising, therefore, that as more ethnographic artifacts began to appear in museums, colonial expositions, and curio shops, 
that individuals other than ethnologists and anthropologists began to discover them and were intrigued by them for reasons other than scientific analysis or mere curiosity with the exotic. So that's where I'll pick up next week and start talking about uh, artists and some of what they were interested in these objects. So thank you very much.